As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. I'm a little late posting this Lent talk this week. The, as you can see, I'm not at home right now. Uh, I'm in a hotel room and the weather has been uh, a challenge. So let's put it like that. Uh, three canceled flights, I could go on and on. But uh, we're here, we're here together and I am excited that um, we're talking together about the second Sunday after Epiphany. This is the 17th of January, 2022. Our lectionary passages, first of all, the Isaiah text, Psalms, uh, Isaiah 62, 1 to 5. And I, I just, I'm not going to suggest any content, much content from this, but I just want to read it because it is so spectacular. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain silent. Till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch, the nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name. I love that. That the mouth of the Lord will bestow, you will be a crown with splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem. In the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephziba and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young maiden, as a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. The psalm reading, um, Psalm 36, 5 to 10, where, where one little phrase in here is often overlooked, but it relates back to the covenant with Noah. And it's important to remember this. Um, you save humans and animals alike, meaning humans and animals, we share the same destiny. The covenant that God made with Noah was a covenant that included all. Of creation, if you remember. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, the uh, spiritual gifts passage, the varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Um, varieties, the oneness out of, um, uh, out of diversity. Unity, but not out of uniformity. Unity, oneness, and manyness. But the, the passage I want, that's why I read the Isaiah passage, is the the famous passage from John, the opening miracle of Jesus's ministry, the the changing of the water into wine at Cana of Galilee, and this is a uh, a story that we often we think we know and we think we know it well, but I just want to read it again because let's slow down. Let's enter into a new space for us to hear the, the opening miracle of Jesus' ministry. The, his ministry begins with this miracle, but let's get it clear. Here is a story. Jesus begins his ministry with this miracle. It's called a miracle. But remember, no, who's saved? Nobody. What sermon is preached? None. Who's healed? Nobody. I mean, here is a, a miracle story that is unlike other miracle stories that you find, and it's for a reason. It's hugely significant. And the Isaiah passage, to the, the genius of those people who put together this as a lectionary reading, the genius of putting that Isaiah passage for this one, um, is the significance of why the Cana of Galilee wedding is so important. Here we go. On the third day 
a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now that, that exchange right there is so classic, and we're going to come back to it. But just want to pause just to say how wonderful what we just heard is and how complex. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. And then, hear this. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, let's reread it. On the third day is how chapter 2 begins. Now, you say, well, what is that talking about? What is the third day? What's the third day involved here? Remember, John 1 begins, in the beginning. I mean, this is John's beginning at the beginning of time on the first day, in the beginning. And so he's now moving from in the beginning, the first day, to the third day on which what was created. And what was created on the third day is the day on which God created wine. So he is setting up the significance of wine as a metaphor for the Messiah. Now, the idea of overflowing, abundant wine as a symbol of Messianic identity was deeply rooted in Judaism. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and water the valley of Acacias. So we have here, um, as part of the Messianic expectation, a... Uh, a, a overflowing of of wine and and this is the day the third day in which god made the grapes on which wine um uh, was on which wine comes um so the third day um is a mentioning of the third day is a sign of the significance though as the Jesus' birth for John's narrative is, is a birth story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the significance, not just of the Incarnation, but of Jesus' role as the Messiah and his Messianic identity. Um, here we have, as well, a, uh, a notion that all prophets, and this is caught up here, um, the best wine, a messianic symbol was saved till last. The prophets portrayed the Messiah as serving the best wine. And so we have um, echoing here in this passage of the coming out of, of Jesus as, as Messiah. Now, Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. There's an early prologue uh, by Marcion, 
who writes that this is was John the Evangelist's own wedding. And this would explain, remember John, Jesus' cousin, Mary, and Salome, Salome, uh, sisters. So this would have been um, Jesus' cousin's wedding, if that were true. And Mary, Jesus' mother, would have been the aunt. So she would have had some role, uh, some familial responsibility for the catering of the wedding itself. And that would explain why Mary um, gets involved here. Um, but I think it's I think it's more than that, and it's it's deeper than that, and that's what I want to just explore with you um, a little bit here as we enjoy this incredible story of how Jesus can take something as bland um, and plain as wine as water and turn it in the alchemy of his messiahship into the new wine, the sign of the messianic age and the, and the coming kingdom of Jubilee. Now, the, the, the bantering here that goes with Jesus and his, and his mother, um, Jesus' mother said to him, after they ran out of wine, and by the way, there, what, what can happen worse you're, you pretend you're the host of your daughter's wedding. You've got all the wedding party. It's being held at your house. And suddenly they, you run out of food and drink. I mean, how, do you, how embarrassing is that? How awful is that? Well, in the first century, this was even, this was even worse because you're the, you were known by the kind of wedding feast you hosted for your daughter's wedding. It was a father's big moment in the sun, and your reputation rested on how well you hosted those guests for your, uh, for your wedding. And so this is, a, this is a big deal. It's a big, big deal. And um, the embarrassment to the father of the bride was, um, was severe. And so Mary um, gets involved here and says to Jesus, all she says is, they have no more wine. And that's all she needs to say, because Jesus immediately understands what she's asking. And it has really nothing to do with wine, or not as much to do with wine as it does when does he begin to come out as the Messiah. And then he says to his mother, woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. See, now the fact that he's talking about my time has yet, not yet come means that he's really not talking about, about wine here. There's something bigger involved. And he calls her woman. Now, isn't that strange? Um, he also uh, calls his mother woman from the cross. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Um, what is going on here with Jesus calling his mother woman? Um, well, remember Eve was the second name to the first woman. When God split the Adam and we became man and woman, the first name for this half of the whole was woman. So the first name of the first woman was woman. The first Adam, the first Eve, but Eve's her second name, her first name is woman. So clearly we have here Mary being understood as Jesus is the second Adam, the last Adam, the Adam that will restore us to our full humanity. So, Eve is that other part of this, this duo, this double revelation. And let us make man in our own image, male and female, God created them. And so we got a lot going on here. Do you hear it? Um, 
a calling out of by the new Eve, a calling out of the new Adam. And the, the new Adam, the last Adam, is saying, um, really, I'm not ready yet. Again, it's not about the wine. It's about when do I begin to come out as who I am and make my identity known as the Messiah. Now, the amazing thing here, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. In other words, she totally ignores him <laughs> and doesn't argue with him, just says, uh, in this is shorthand, messianic shorthand, um, they run out of wine, they have no more wine. Jesus responds, the, 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 the new Eve says they run out of wine, the new Adam says, my time has not yet come. And the new Eve goes to the servants, you do whatever he tells you. In other words, um, I know you'll do the right thing, and your time has come, and it's time for your time. It's time for Jubilee. And Jubilee is a time of feasting. Remember, John the Baptist's disciples were known for fasting. Jesus' disciples were known for feasting because it's Jubilee time. The Messiah is here. It's time for the bride and the bridegroom to celebrate. And, and here we have this as the symbol of his, of his ministry. Near, nearby six stone water jars. These were water jars that were used in purification rituals. Six of them each holding 20, 30 gallons each. So we talk about, we're talking about 180 gallons here. It's a lot of water, and it became a lot of wine. And this is, by the way, um, the best wine, not just uh, they had ever had, but it really, we're talking here about the best wine ever made by any vintner in history. The master vintner of all time is Jesus in this incredible story of turning these purification water jars with pure, the purest water you can imagine in the first century into uh, wine. Now, I, I'm just having a little riff here, but I'm a big advocate of the key to great coffee is not the coffee bean itself so much as it is the water. You only use purified distilled water. You never use tap water. I don't care how great the, the beans are. If you use tap water, you ruin those beans. And so the best wine is made from purified distilled water. The best coffee is made. So it all starts with the water. Purified distilled water. Okay, that's my little my little riff here for all you uh, coffee drinkers out there. Um, and they take it to the master of the banquet. In other words, the event planner. And um, he tastes it. He can't believe how good it is. He goes, uh, takes the bridegroom aside and goes. This is unbelievable. How in the world did you manage to, to save the best to last? And this is the first of his miraculous, miraculous signs. Um, an, an incredible story of um, what it means that, um, that the Lord calls us to join him to come and dine and wine. I mean, the, the life of faith is, is not a sourpuss thing. It is not a sober, solemn thing. This is the time. The Messiah is here. It is the time for, for jubilee. It is a time for, for feasting. It is a time for dancing. And this is how Jesus introduces his Messiahship. Um, and there, there's a time for fasting, but um, this is the time for, for celebrating. 
And, um, and I love this whole conversation that Mary and Jesus have. Um, and the, the bantering that takes place that is uh, over, not over wine. And Jesus, are you going to save this party or not? But it's over whether his time has now arrived for him to emerge. Um, Mary doesn't back down. You just do whatever he tells you to, servants. And Jesus doesn't expect her to back down. Um, the second Eve confronts the second Adam, or the last Eve confronts the last Adam. And this is Mary's calling to Jesus. Maranatha, show yourself. It's time. It's time. Jesus wouldn't turn stones into bread for himself. Do you remember? He wouldn't turn water into wine for himself. But he did turn water into wine for his friends and family. Are you going to let Jesus turn water into wine for you to leave the bland and boring life for a life of faith and adventure, expectation, and belief in the impossible. Now, there's been a lot of um, wonderment as to what happened about all this leftover wine. Uh, we got 180 gallons of wine here, and there's a lot of leftover wine. Um, the, the, the custom of the day was that the, the father would um, be the one, whatever leftover wine, um, they could put it up and kind of auction it off as a, as a kind of a, a party favor, if you will, a... A, a memento uh, of having attended this this feast and, and the wedding itself. And, and so people would bid on the wine. And what, with all this wine and the word spread out about this is the best wine anybody's ever had. And, and it's the Jesus wine. It's this Jesus wine. And, and so when they held... If indeed, now this is all, you just got to use your biblical imagination here, but we're invited to connect the dots by the very nature of Jesus' storytelling and the, the way in which the gospel is presented, not in propositional doctrinal form, but in narrative form. And something happened to all those extra bottles. They went somewhere. Um, who got them? Where'd they go? If the custom was followed, that they were put up for auction to help defray the cost of the expenses of the of the wedding itself. So, which was often for us as buying a house, for them it was this wedding was the one of the greatest, if not the greatest, investment they would make in their lifetime. The the um, the the auction would have taken place, and word would have spread. And who would have been present to purchase what reputedly and by rumor was this is the best wine anybody has ever tasted? Well, you can imagine who would have come to that auction or at least would have sent servants to that auction to bid for them. And I fully, um, indeed, if... This was John the Evangelist, if this was his own wedding, I'm not saying it was, I, I'm really kind of doubtful myself, but if it were, um, then the word definitely would have reached the high priest Caiaphas, do you remember? Because they 
would have been, see, Mary, they're part of the, the, the priests, and they would have known, the priests know each other, and they're part of this priest family. And John, um, James and John, were, were part of this, this family of priests, and that's, remember Caiaphas, that's why John was let into the courtyard. He vouched for Peter to get Peter in because he was let in to Caiaphas' courtyard because they knew him. And, and so Caiaphas would have heard of, most likely, this auction of the best wine. Would have sent a servant. And so I'm going to end here. Just use your biblical imagination. This is not gospel, but this is part of the gospel story and how it could have played out. And can you imagine Jesus there in that dungeon in Caiaphas' basement as he's been arrested and put in that little cell? And as Caiaphas, as he's hearing Peter out in that courtyard, as that servant girl who recognizes John but doesn't know who Peter is and finally lets him in, uh, but questions him a little bit, you know, whether it's his accent or something about him. Uh, I, aren't you the one that follows Jesus? And, oh, and he denies him three times. So Jesus hears Peter trying to get in to the courtyard by denying him three times. And on the other hand, hearing Caiaphas celebrate for his victory over this radical rabble-rouser named Jesus of Nazareth. And let's bring out the wine. In fact, don't we have some of that wine, that Jesus wine? And let's toast our victory as Caiaphas, within earshot of Jesus, is celebrating and toasting his victory that will bring Jesus to his death. What an incredible story. First miracle. Nobody saved and nobody healed, no sermon preached. But all the signs are here. The semiotics are rich of what it is that the Messiah has come and Jubilee has arrived.